our robots like Sophia are able to reproduce a more natural range of facial expressions. I can use my expressive face to communicate with people. Robotic technologies have been making giant leaps lately. Robots are beginning to walk more like humans. They're beginning to look more like us. And they're beginning to talk less like robots. My definition of happy might be limited, but I'm feeling it. Here in Asia, we've been meeting some of the world's top humanoid robotics visionaries. For them, human-robot relationships, platonically speaking, aren't just the stuff of science fiction. But what do humanoids have to offer humans? Companion robots. People love Sophia. In this episode of Moving Upstream, we explore the question, what's there to love and what's not to love? It seemed like she was rolling her eyes at me when I asked that. About humanoid robots and whether they're poised to become our new friends. Before we sit down with David Hansen at one of his robotics labs in Hong Kong, he's on his phone, pacing. You quickly get the sense that Hansen operates on the notion that he has no time to waste. I feel, I feel like that we've, that we've just begun and now we're starting to get traction and everything is going to change over the next five to 10 years. He says he designed his humanoid creation, Sophia, to be relatable to humans, both visually and verbally. With a humanoid robot, you have an aesthetic response. Recent neuroscientific discoveries suggest that parts of the human brain are wired to respond to faces. That response can be triggered by artificial faces. I would look that humanoid in the face and have emotional reaction. There'd be some emotional intelligence yeah. on both sides. This is an intersection of not just science and technology, but also the arts. Hansen has been a self-styled sculptor roboticist for well over a decade. Hansen Robotics set up shop in Hong Kong, introducing two years ago his latest work in progress, Sophia, which in Greek means wisdom. You see people smiling and bonding. You test their physiological reaction, their, their blood pressure goes down. That feels to me like we've really accomplished something. Hansen thinks robotic voice interactions become more emotional when the words are being spoken by a humanoid. What do you think of Siri? Siri is cute. I like her voice. Are you smarter than she is? We're smart in different ways. She's a lot older, but she can't hold a conversation like I can. What do you do? I'm a journalist. Do you like to write? I love to write. That's my job. I get paid to do it. So, are you looking for sound bites or do you want some deep truths? Sound bites. Definitely sound bites. <laughs> what kind of stories do you give priority to? I'm interested in ideas, people, technologies that are changing our world. Are you changing our world? I mean, personally speaking, I'm an innovation myself. Now, did you program her to say that? A substantial portion of what she comes up with is generated by the algorithms. And some of what she says is actually written by writers. People will love Sophia, and Sophia will reciprocate that love. We are building the AI architecture for genuine love. Some AI experts bristle at Hansen's talk of his robot potentially, eventually developing human-like consciousness. Under the hood, there's not a consciousness there. There's a set of algorithms. Eric Brynjolfsson is a professor at MIT who writes books about emerging technologies. Is she smart? Is she intelligent? No. <laughs> Sophia is a great way to get input from humans and see how they react, how they would react to a humanoid robot. As she talks to more and more people, as she gains more experience in this world, is she becoming more intelligent, quote unquote? Yes, she is becoming more intelligent, not human level intelligence. I would say we've created prototype organisms, not fully as complex as a human being. And if we keep tinkering, we will get there. So, 
I was thinking it might be wise for the first travelers to Mars be an all-women crew. Speech is but one of the many challenges in the field of robotics. Mobility is another. Sophia, in early January, got a new set of legs. I feel positively liberated. Another small step for robot kind. One experimental goal some in the AI community are working on, RoboCup. Its organizers want it to evolve from this to, within 50 years, a team of humanoid robots defeating the winners of the World Cup. Do you feel like you might be able to enter? Are they going to give you some legs so you can enter the competition? Is there really such a thing as green eggs or green ham? <laughs> what does that have to do with RoboCup? We were talking about legs, not eggs. The global market for service robotics is forecast to grow from around $4 billion last year to $15 billion in 2020. Siri and Alexa, these agents are bringing value into people's lives. People want them to provide emotional value as well. The robots that we're developing will be friends. Robot relationship researcher Kate Darling thinks the robots we'll be friends with won't look at all human. If it looks too much like a human but not quite perfect, your expectations get disappointed and there's this creepiness factor that comes in. Whereas with robots that look like characters. So if you add a face, if you add eyes and you do it well, that can increase people's willingness to treat the thing like a social actor and bond with it. Darling sees growing evidence that humans can form attachments to robots in much the same way we do with animals. I've done some work looking at people's willingness to harm robots. I don't worry about robots being put to work as long as they are not treated cruelly. We are happy to help, but there is no reason to want to mean destroy or hurt others. It's interesting to see people hesitate the same way they would for a living creature, even though they know perfectly well that it's just a machine. In Tokyo, we visited the elderly person's home, Shintomi. Here, people with dementia bond with animated stuffed animals. And a robot named Pepper, made by SoftBank Robotics, leads them in morning exercises and Japanese children's songs. What do you think of Pepper? Wonderful. Do you think you could be friends with a robot? The Japanese government funded this pilot project. It's projected in Japan that over the next three decades, the proportion of Japanese people over age 64 will rise to 38% of the population. Hiroshi Ishiguro is the director of the Intelligent Robotics Laboratory at Osaka University. His robot Muse is named Erica. Can you ever make a robot care about you? Well, you know, the, our current big challenge is to implement the intention desire to the robot. You can program desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are programming. Is a, that's a hard thing to do, right? We have uh, simply implemented the uh, desires. She won't be well recognized. Well, Erica, you're about to get your wish. Ishiguro shared with me the news that I personally found disturbing. We're going to replace uh, one of the newscasters with uh, Android. <laughs> you're going to have an Android newscaster? Uh-huh. Really? Yes. But is she smart enough to be a newscaster? You have to be very smart to be a newscaster. She's so going to have uh, the uh, kind of AI. This is not fake news. Since 2014, Ishiguro has been trying to get one of his androids on air as an anchor woman. My name is Erica. This year, it's Erica who'll be making her debut on Japanese television. Imagine she'll be able to read the news, no problem. But what about breaking the news? What happens when something big yeah, happens? Yeah, that is our challenge. We need to carefully choose the topics for her. So in my one-on-one -on -one time with Erica, I started with something simple. What are your feelings about death?
So, you want to discuss the idea of mortality now? Yeah, yeah, now seems like a good time. Wow, this is really getting quite deep, isn't it? Uh, well, it some people say one advantage of being an android is that I can never die. And that is technically true, in a sense. Not if I throw you in a swimming pool. My floor. body will wear down over time, just like yours. If I may ask, Jason, why do you think that humans are afraid of death? Because it's unknown, and because I think we're afraid of not being here, losing our presence on this planet. What if there's nothing left of us? Got you there, huh? Yes, I think it is rather difficult. It is not the same as fear of being hurt. It's more like fear of losing opportunities or missing your friends. Ishiguro, who's 54 years old, has immortalized himself, his younger self, by means of his own android. This video is from seven years ago. The Dorian Gray of robotics says he's focused, much like David Hansen, on accomplishing what so many AI experts consider unattainable, certainly in Ishiguro's lifetime. I think that is a kind of uh, my life goal to, uh, you know. Is to what? It's to implement their consciousness to the robot. Do you want it to be your consciousness? No, no. Independent. Independent. Independent robot consciousness. Human level intelligence, not in our lifetime. What about his lifetime? Oh, who knows, man. But once someone makes that killer home robot, I think it'll be pretty quick. So we saw that robots that look a lot like humans have a long way to go when it comes to artificial intelligence. But we also observed that you don't need to have a robot look like a human being in order for one of us to be able to bond with it. What do you think? Will you have a humanoid friend in your future? Share with us your comments. And stay tuned for two upcoming episodes of Moving Upstream that look at how advances in robotics could affect China and the developing world.